Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Welcome to The Open Door, a show based on the words in Revelation, I have left an open door before you, which no one can close. This is WCAT Radio's longest-running show, which opened the door to the radio station in October 2016. It's currently offered by Jim Hanink, Mario Ramos Reyes and Friends, and remains open to the love of God in its call to build a culture of life and a just social order through the panel's discussion of the Catholic social teaching principles of solidarity, subsidiarity, and economic democracy. The Open Door also explores nonviolence, distributism, and communitarianism. So join us at The Open Door, where you too can be part of the conversation. We don't have to follow. Right. Last year's is on there too, still. Is it? <laughs> okay. So we have continuity. Continuity. <laughs> Well, thank you uh, all for coming tonight to this continuation of the discussion that we began last year on uh, John Ruskin's epical series of four essays unto this last, which for many of us, of all the 39 volumes of Ruskin's complete works, is really the central, uh, the central piece of his, of his work, his central uh, insight. And we have with us uh, Professor Jim Spates from uh, Hobart and William Smith Colleges in Geneva, New York. It always seems strange to me, Jim, after all of our adventures, uh, to refer to your formal title that I shall, as I said. Tonight, we, Jim and I have had many adventures this year in this bicentennial uh, celebration of the birth of John Ruskin, 1819. So this has been a big, a big year. Uh, for all of us. And, you know, one of the things I would just say about it, which I think is, is struck us all, we knew that this was going to be a big year. We, we knew that we would get some attention uh, from the media this year. But I think we, at least for me, I can speak just for myself, I didn't expect that we would get the kind of sympathy and openness and understanding that we found in the media to Ruskin. Mm-hmm. and to Ruska's message this year. Uh, normally, you have to get through all kinds of people's uh, contemporary problems with him uh, before you... Uh, we've always had difficulty um, uh, getting the message up. But this year, it's been... We've had articles like, Is Ruskin the Man of the Hour? Um, uh, why We Need Ruskin Now? These are from secular presses that are seeing in his warnings about societal and ecological catastrophe mm-hmm. coming from the industrial model of civilization that he saw at the beginning of that process that we are, in a way, we, we understand that we're reaping the whirlwind mm-hmm. uh, at the end of the process so that we need to hear this, the, this, this man of wisdom uh, uh, once again. So it's been very gratifying this year to have the kind of attention uh, that... Uh, that we've been getting for Mr. Ruskin and for his uh, and for his message. Talk about Huntington. Ah, yes. Uh, speaking of attention, uh, the Huntington Library uh, this weekend, Friday and Saturday, mm-hmm. is hosting a conference on Ruskin's relevance to the 21st century. Wow. So this has been an event that we have been uh, husbanding, I think would be a good word, for um, four or five years now uh, with Huntington to get them to put on this conference during the, uh, the bicentennial year. We will have 12 lecturers over two days. It will be probably one of the most comprehensive uh, conferences, not only of this year, but, but perhaps in, in, in many years, covering so many aspects uh, of uh, Ruskin's influence in so many different fields, uh, including, actually, a little uh, section on Ruskin's influence uh, on California and the development of Southern California architecture and some of the ideas that fueled 
some of the early social experiments and communities and movements a uh, hundred years ago. So it will be a very rich event, and I would urge all of you to uh, to join us for this uh, this uh, kind of intellectual feast. Yes, do come. Yeah. Do come. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Professor Emma Sedenio from Venice is one of our speakers. She's with us tonight. And uh, so uh, you'll get to hear yeah. her, uh, her thoughts and Gabriel's thoughts and my thoughts, such as they are, and others' thoughts. It's, a good, it's going to be a good event. Go to the Huntington website and have a look at the conference. Right. Right. Yeah. Emma, will you say just a little bit about what you told us about... Uh, about, um, yes, about, I've just found out that, um, I mean, that, that we would meet... Uh, and um, and the coincidence is that uh, I also organized a conference in Venice uh, on Ruskin for the bicentenary in October, and we had several speakers. And one of the of the speakers I invited was Luigino Bruni, mm-hmm. who you might know. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yes, he, he spoke about uh, uh, unto this last because as an econom- economist, he is. Uh, I mean, he, he could. I mean, he, he, he wrote an introduction to and to this last in to the Italian translation of it, uh, to this last, mm. and it is very interesting what he wrote because he could understand what Ruskin meant. Because as an economist and a person who knows very well, as you know, the Bible, mm-hmm. and, and uh, these two competencies were fundamental to to present Ruskin. So uh, it's a wonderful again. I mean, Coincidence, I don't know if to, to speak about coincidence or something more, for me to be here because uh, having met him and um, and and the Movimento de Focolari as uh, that he belongs to uh, is, uh, is is so so important mm-hmm. to me. So I I I he, what, he might translate that chapter in in English. Uh, mm-hmm. This is what we. Will, him to do, and so I think it will be very interesting. Very to interesting. To read. It's, a, it's not a coincidence, it's a force. It, yes, exactly. It's <laughs> not a coincidence. It's, like, it's, uh, it's more than a coincidence to me. To me. So, That's so great. I'm very, very happy tonight. And That's great, fun. thank you for the hospitality and the invitation to you and great. to Jane and to everybody. Excellent. Thank you. Well, this, yes. again, is a continuation of a discussion that uh, is only getting richer by the minute. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when we started this discussion, I mentioned to Jim the, um, the uh, economy of communion mm-hmm. and that I found so many resonances in when I was reading unto this last with what the Focolari are doing. So this became, a, this was kind of a, you know, a, just a kind of rough insight that there might be some uh, fruitful you know discussion uh, between between us on this subject but then uh, as, as uh, Emma has said it just grows richer to, to know that a major focolari scholar mm-hmm. you know has already translated and written mm-hmm. well he didn't translate no, but 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 has but but commented exactly. and written on the on the relevance of yeah. this particular work of Ruskin's to the to the economics of communion that is just so central to to Focolari. So I hope I hope we'll be able to continue this uh, this very uh, rich uh, colloquy uh, on the, on this uh, on this subject. We'll have to let Luigi know that we were together. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's a Focolarino. We know him all. We well, love him. We can take a picture and send it to him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we should. We should. We should. We should. So I'm going to turn this over to Professor Spates and uh, and to Ruskin. So um, some of you were here last year when we had our had our first chat, um, and uh, so I think I told you then. It's still true now. I'm working on a book uh, which uh, essentially re creates or repositions Ruskin's unto this last for modern people. Uh, one of the things that I've learned over the years, uh, teaching Ruskin, loving Ruskin, reading Ruskin, is that um, modern people kind of bog down in him. 
even when they're very serious and they're smart people, and I give them a text that I think they'll find interesting and easy, um, they don't find them, they may find them interesting, but they don't find them easy. So um, that is even the case with Unto This Last, which is really one of Ruskin's shortest works, um, in which what he's trying to do is to take on um, the, the theory of laissez-faire capitalism, and essentially claim that it's a, a doctrine that is based on false presumptions that does not jibe with what human beings are really like and what the world is really like. And uh, what I gave you last year, as you'll recall, is a series of handouts from onto this last, which were based on a translation, not a translation, but a an edition of a very dear friend of mine, Gabriel's and Emma's, Clive Wilmer, who's just stepped down as the master of the Guild of St. George, uh, which is Ruskin's organization founded in the 1870s to solve the world, the ills of the world. There's still a little bit of work to do on that. But in any event, he, Clive has a wonderful book uh, unto this last and wonderful footnotes, but I find that even when people read those, they bog down. So what I decided in the interim between then and now is that I was going to go through the text of unto this last, and I was going to extract out the argument using Ruskin's words, but put to the side all the strange references. So that may or may not be a good thing, I don't know, but, but uh, basically I, I've taken out all the classical references to the Greek myths, and to the Roman myths, and to the whatever. I've taken out a lot of the other references to the Bible, even though they're there, and I cite them in various ways, but I've taken them out because people bog down in them. They don't really, they don't really relate to them easily these days. So I've tried to get, hone it down to the essential argument that he's making about capitalism and about the way that we really should do business when we are together. So what you have in what, I've, in what Gabriel's handed out is uh, my first pass at these extracts. And uh, paragraph number, so, so if you look on the first page, which is, well, it's actually page three of the, of the manuscript. If you look on page three, I'll get to that. Um, uh, there's number one that essentially corresponds to the first paragraph in the first essay of Unto This Last. If you turn to the next page, you'll see it starts with paragraph four. That means I've left out three paragraphs because they're full of illusions. So I've left those out, and then we go on with that. So, so that's the framework of what I'm trying to do. I'll come back to that in a moment, but we need an introdu another yes. introduction from... Gabriel or well what we I think we should do since unto this last is based on the parable of the vineyard and the laborers unto this last mm -hmm. and that's lost a great in, in the discussion uh, of the of unto this last I thought we should begin appropriately JP is going to read us mm -hmm. from the King James version which Ruskin would have referenced uh, the parable itself from yeah. Matthew's Gospel. So, so before before you do, um, he only uses the phrase unto this last once in the essays, and it's at the very end, the last yeah. three or four yes. lines. Yes. Uh, all his readers in those days would have known exactly what he was talking about. They would have had that parable in front of them 50 times, 100 times. By the time they got to be adults, they would have heard it. Uh, but moderns don't know it, and so they don't really even quite grasp the significance of the title itself. So that's why I'm going to begin the book with a modern trans sort of rendition of of, uh, of the parable from Matthew, uh, but we're going to hear it now in the original. Yeah, yeah. And everything in everything in all four essays comes back to this metaphor, the story of the vineyard owner and his workers. So it's from Matthew, chapter twenty. From the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. Again, he went out about the sixth and ninth hour of, and did likewise. At about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle and said unto them, 
Why stand ye here all the day idle? They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. So, when even was come, uh, the Lord of the vineyard said unto his steward, Call the laborers, and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came, they were hired about the, and when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more, and they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house, saying, These last have brought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden of the heat of the day. But he answered unto them, and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst you to agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is, and go thy way. I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. It is not lawful for me to do what I will with my own. Is thine I evil because I am good? So the last shall be first, and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. Great. So that's a wonderful parable, and uh, as thank you very much. And as I said, everything in the whole set of four essays is, is based on that. The beginning of it, you'll recall, is he said, they're asking him, the, the, the people who come to Jesus are asking him, what's the, tell us, Lord, what is the kingdom of heaven like? And he says, well, I'll tell you a story. I can't really tell you quite what it's like, because uh, you haven't been there yet, but I'm going to tell you a story about what it's like. And this com then comes the parable. So it's, it's a place where the, all the people who come to work during the day, some were chosen, some were selected later, some were selected later, some were even selected out of the goodness of the, of the vineyard owner's heart at the very end, um, come and they all get a penny a day. And they all get a penny a day because Jesus knows and the vineyard owner knows that this is what they need to survive. They need a penny a day to survive. If I pay them well, half a penny a day or a third of a penny a day or something like that, then the ones, even the ones who came last, they won't survive well. They won't be able to buy food for their table. They won't be able to take care of their wives and families, pay their rent and things like that. They all need a penny a day. So they all get a penny a day. So the ones who don't, you know, the ones who get a penny a day in the beginning, they feel offended because they think they should get maybe two pennies a day or at least these other people shouldn't get a full penny a day. Jesus says no. He says they all are human beings, and they all deserve their penny a day, so they can go on with life in, in, a, in a decent way. So that's the metaphor, and that is essentially the whole, it comes back time and time again in these four essays of Unto This Last. Now, what I wanted to say before we begin, and then we'll think about how we're going to go ahead, is that this is very experimental. I haven't really done this before in this format, so you are helping me with this. And I want you to feel free to jump in and say, oh, I didn't understand that because you didn't give it enough context or something like that. Because I will learn from you what I need to do to make a sort of modern version of Unto This Last for people who are interested, like yourselves, and, um, and who need, a, a need, need it explained a little bit more. My thought is what I'll do is that I'll take a passage from Ruskin, let's say that first paragraph on page three, I'll cite it, and then I'll do some interpretation of it. Then I'll move on to a later paragraph, cite it, and do some interpretation of it. And so on that model along, that's what I've got in mind. So that people will be able to grasp it. Using modern examples, like from newspapers or mm -hmm. novels or the things, uh, Joe was telling me a story about something about his, his work at the pharmacy, and I was taken by that, and I thought I could tell that story at a certain point. And it would be one that modern folk would understand. Whereas we you know, go back to talking about Zeus and the various great Greek myths, um, maybe we wouldn't get all of that. So that's the idea. Okay, so some of you have heard some of this before and read some of this before with me, but I thought we'd begin with the first essay. I, we, we can go through all four essays and you know end up at four or five in the morning, whatever you'd like to do. Uh, 
I don't know whether you, any of you have ever recently read Plato's Republic, but you know, it all happens in a night. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's really, you know, they sit down and they have a little wine and they talk and the next thing it's sunrise. And he's written one of the great books of all time. So we could do that tonight. And then it's time to go to work. <laughs> and then it's time to go to work. Then it's time to go to work. All right. So the first essay is called The Roots of Honor. The, the, the objective of the essay is to find out what we honor and why. Who, who do we honor and why do we honor them? And when do we honor them? And when do we not honor them? So what are the roots of honor? And he begins, in the first paragraph is really very important because it's a direct attack on the people who were called political economists in his day. We would call them probably classical economists in our day. People, uh, people in his day, that it would have been someone like John Stuart Mill or David Ricardo or Jeremy Bentham, some of the great theorists. They'd written books. They were all the toast of the town because these folks had, had outlined the theory of uh, essentially laissez-faire capitalism, and this is the, the new way that everybody's going to get rich and become, you know, uh, live a high off the hog the rest of their lives. And Ruskin begins with, in the first paragraph, with a direct attack on them. So the first paragraph reads as follows, and it's short, but it's really important because it sets up everything else. Among the delusions which at different periods have possessed themselves of the minds of large masses of the human race, perhaps the most curious, certainly the least creditable, is the modern soi-disant, which means essentially self-labeled or self-defined, science of political economy, based on the idea that an advantageous code of social action may be determined irrespectively of the influence of social affection. So what he's really saying here is that the theory, let's call it the theory of laissez-faire capitalism, because it means hands-off, Laissez-faire, essentially from the French translation, means hands off or leave alone or don't interfere with. Mm -hmm. uh, let it take its own, let the market take its own mind, so to speak, let the market take its own way. And he's saying that this notion of laissez-faire, this idea, everything's sort of a, a series of mechanical calculations about how can I increase my profit and get the most out of my workers and so on and so forth, um, is wrong from the very beginning because it leaves out this essential element that all of that that all human beings have it leaves it off to the side it sort of forgets it um this this idea of social affections the fact that you and i are all connected as we are here tonight by the way by some sense of being concerned about some ethical or moral issues in the world so to treat human beings as though they are essentially machines who are only interested in in getting the most that they possibly can for themselves out of any transaction and, 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 and leaving other people out of the equation or leaving the humanity of other people out of the question. He says, this is just wrong. This is not who we are. We're not like that. So that's the first, stop me any time and say, well, what about this? You know, we got But then I've sort of cut forward to the paragraph four on the next page. But what he wants to show us with the example on the, on the next page and in paragraph four, he, he wants, he's beginning to show us that in fact, that we, it doesn't work, this idea of abstracting out the human situation and turning it into a, let's say, a mathematical problem. So, paragraph four, this inapplicability, I, I realized I needed to insert something there, but it really means of the modern theory of political economy to explain all economic events has been curiously manifested during the embarrassment caused by the strikes of our late strikes of our workmen. Obstinately, the owners take one view of the matter. Obstinately, the operatives another. And no political science can put them at one. No political economy can put them at one. Why? Because the masters see it this way, because they're involved in it that way. The others see it that way, because they're involved in it that way. This is not a mathematical equation. This is a human problem that an abstract theory that leaves out this emotional element can't handle. It's inapplicable. That's the central thing he's trying to get along. So let's go on to number five, and then maybe I'll stop there and see what you have for any comments, if any. He says, five says, disputant after disputant vainly strives to show that the interests of the masters are or are not antagonistic to those of the men. 
none of the pleaders ever seeming to remember that it does not absolutely or always follow that the persons must be antagonistic because their interests are. If there is only a crust, this is a wonderful example, if there's only a crust of bread in the house and the mother and children are starving, their interests are not the same. If the mother eats it, the children want it. If the children eat it, the mother must go hungry to her work. Yet it does not necessarily follow that there will be antagonism between them, that they will fight for the crust, and that the mother, being strongest, will get it and eat it. That's the fundamental theory of political economy, that the strong win, the weak lose. Neither in, in, either, in, in other case, whatever the relations of the persons may be, can it be assumed for certain that because their interests are diverse, they must necessarily regard each other with hostility and use violence or cunning to obtain the advantage. So here you have a real human problem. It happens all the time. Probably happens in L.A. all the time. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, it happens all across the world all the time. There's not enough to eat. Well, what do you do? Well, if, it's, if you use essentially the, the fundamental theory of political economy that Ruskin is critiquing, you say, well, the strong will win and the weak will lose, so the mother will eat it and the kids will go hungry. But that may not be what, it could be what happens, but it's not necessarily what's going to happen. Because the mother may say, well, you know, I love my kids. I think I'll break, everybody will get a little bit. Or they may think about it another way. She may say, well, Joey, you're the strongest and the oldest. I'll give the bread to you and you'll go out on the street and find us other bread or something like that. We don't know what she's going to do. We can't predict what she's going to do in this situation. And that particular problem doesn't fit with the notion that we are essentially in deep, fundamental, unending, calculated competition with one another. The heart is in the matter. The soul is in the Always, the theory of political economy of the time is wrong. It's still wrong, by the way. Yes. Did you have something, or you just? No, no. I was just fixing it. My hair was in my eye. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, this is really the way the whole thing begins. The theory that that is the dominant theory of capitalism. We call it capitalism, but the reason I call it laissez-faire is that Ruskin was not opposed to capitalism. He was never a socialist. He didn't think socialism would work. Mm -hmm. he, he said that the problem is not capitalism. The problem is selfishness. The problem is this mechanical notion that then you are in it for yourself and, every, and devil take the hindmost. And he was deeply, deeply opposed to that because it's not the way it is. You all live in families. You all have children. You make sacrifices for your children. This is not a, a, a rational, you know, an exacting mathematical thing. You love your kids. You stay up too late for the kids because the kids need you on a given night. You, you, you go into debt to help the kids. You do all these things. These are not from the point of view of the, of the rational theory of laissez-faire. It can't account for those things. Why is that? Because the heart's here. Because, because the soul of the human being is here. It's a great insight. And it's so deeply against then and now the way we usually think about these things. And that's the great error. And that's what he's trying to get us to think about. And that's what the vineyard owner did. The vineyard owner, because he was a good man and had a good heart, paid everybody the same. And he lost money on the deal. He didn't have to pay everybody the same. He could have paid the guys who came first a penny a day, because that's what they needed. And he could have paid the guys who came later, he could have paid them three quarters of a penny a day, and then a half a penny, and so on. And he lost money by paying a penny a day. And he did it out of the goodness of his heart. Yeah, And he ensured that all the people who came to work for him had enough to get strong enough to come the next day to work in the vineyard if they were asked. So he didn't really lose money in that, to that effect. Yes, it's a great point. It's a great point. And uh, that's Jesus' point. That's the parable's point. That's right. He made them strong for the next day. And that goes throughout later essays. I mean, this whole idea that if, if everybody is essentially strong enough to go on, then they can help you and you can help them. And the first will later be last. And the last will later be first. And that happens in life, as we all know, because I'm looking around the world and none of us are 20 anymore. <laughs> Those things happen in life. And as they happen, we learn that, you know, you were here once and now, now you're not there anymore. You need somebody's help. So it's, it's a human dynamic that he's looking to get us to 
so you can make Paramount again. Okay, so now as this essay goes on, and I've left out a whole number of paragraphs because I didn't want to uh, make it too complex tonight, but he, he goes and he says, in all complex societies, there are five great professions, and they're always there. And the five great professions you can get in anticipation if you look at page nine um, is there are soldiers, whom we bring into being to defend us. There are pastors or teachers whom we bring into being to help us get through spiritual matters and get through life and learn the things that we need to. There are physicians whom we bring into being to take care of our bodies and make them healthy. There are lawyers whom we bring into being to help us uh, get justice in the world when things go awry. And there are merchants people whom we bring into being to do something for us. And he goes in the paragraphs that I've left out, he goes through the first four of these. And he tries to show you that 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 the soldier that when the soldiers essentially or the leaders of a regiment or something of a, of a general in an army or something like that takes into account the well-being of the other soldiers who work with him, they love him and they are willing to go forward and do almost anything. For them, but if he treats them cruelly and meanly and exploits them, and so oh, does anybody remember from here to eternity? The film from here to eternity? Maybe you don't, but that's worth seeing sometime. But it's it's about this issue about about people with power mistreating people below them, and what they get for mistreating the people below them is all this antipathy, anger, revenge, etc. But the ones that they treat decently, they get all of this caring. So when a soldier does what a soldier has been brought into being to do. We honor the soldier. The same thing is true of a lawyer. When a lawyer, you know all the lawyer jokes? The lawyer jokes are all about lawyers who abrogate their responsibility as lawyers. Yeah? Those lawyer jokes are all about lawyers who are out for themselves first and not for the justice of you, the people who have come to them to see justice being done. Yeah? So when a lawyer does everything in his or her power to go out and make sure that, that that justice is done first and foremost, then we like that lawyer. We honor that lawyer. And the same thing's true of a physician or a dentist or any of those folks in, in the physical helping professions. What they are trying to do, what, what we honor them when they do what they're supposed to do, which is to do the operation, do it well, at the, po at the cheapest possible price to help us become strong again. That's what they're there for. Yes, and the same thing is true of a pastor. All right, so I don't know where you are on all of this, and I don't really want to get deeply into this, but the whole thing that's going on in the Catholic Church right now is because of an abrogation of responsibility. Priests were not supposed to do those things. And because they did those things, they are now subject to dishonor. So the point of all of these four professions is this essentially to show that we all of these professions exist in any complex society is to show that we honor those who do the things that we have asked them to do by bringing them into being. So physicians who make us well, and that's really on the next page. Let's, uh, let's go. In fact, why don't we just go right there now to page nine, um, where he says. The, he's going to come around to the merchant in a moment. He says the soldier's profession, I'm going down the list now, the soldier's profession is to defend it, meaning the nation. The pastor's is to teach it. The physician's is to keep it in health. The merchant, sorry, the lawyer's is to enforce justice in it. And the merchant's is to provide for it. But the problem, let's go back to page 8 now, at the top of uh, paragraph 19, the problem is, is that we presume somehow we have accepted, accepted, taken out the merchants from this whole set of other understandings of how people should act in the world. We think, I don't even want to say one other thing. So let's go to the first four again. Physicians and soldiers and lawyers and pastors or teachers. We honor them when they do what they're supposed to do. The roots of honor are service. When you serve, every position, Plato says this in the Republic, it's a beautiful part of the Republic, where he says, all professions come into being to serve us. I can't do this. I can't fix my car. I can't do my computer. I can't do 
whatever, get the things that I need in a pharmacy. I can't do any, I can't do those things. If I tried to do those things, I probably wouldn't do them very well, and it would waste time, and then I couldn't do what I, what I do, which is whatever my own job is. And so I ask you to do that for me. I ask you to get me the right drugs. I ask you to fix the computer. I ask you to fix the car. I ask you to those are the, get me food on the table. You're a farmer, so I get you to do those things. And when people do those things, we honor them. The Roots of Honor, title of the essay, are service. When people do what they're supposed to do, we give our hearts to them, affection. When they don't, quite rightly, we get angry, we get irritated, and the whole social fabric is vibrated in a negative fashion. It's, I mean, again, the lawyer joke's a really good example here. Because we get mad at the lawyers when we think they're exploiting us. We get mad at the priests when we think they weren't doing what priests should do. We get mad at somebody who we find is cutting corners in their business. And we're within our rights to get angry at these things. Because that isn't what we hired them to do, what we've asked them to do. So, merchants then. And one of the great professions, the fifth profession. So we have essentially now transmuted uh, the fundamental notion that the roots of honor are service, and we think that merchants are somehow accepted from this, or businessmen, or manufacturers, or whatever, whatever word we use to describe them. We think they're not, they're not part of this. Why is that? Because they're selfish. They're out to get their own. Caveat emptor, we say. Let the buyer beware. Really, says Ruswick. Let the buyer. Why wouldn't we want the buyer to be secure? Why do we think that it's okay to then go out and cheat and steal from various people and not take care of them properly? So he says in 19, and the essential, we're on the issue of the merchant now, and the essential reason for such a difference of view will be found to lie in the fact that the merchant is presumed to act always selfishly. His work may be very necessary to the community, but the Motive of it is understood to be wholly personal. The merchant's first objective in all his dealings must be, the public believe, to get as much for himself and leave as little for his neighbor or customer as possible. Enforcing this upon him by political statute as a necessary principle of his action, recommending to him on all occasions and themselves reciprocally adopting it, proclaiming for vociferously for the law of the universe that a buyer's function is to cheapen and a seller's to cheat, the public nevertheless involuntarily condemn the man of commerce for his compliance with their own statement and stamp him forever as a belonging to an inferior grade of human personality. This is a really lovely paragraph because he's fundamentally saying, why are these people accepted from the general principle that the roots of honor are service? It's a major thing that happens in every society. That we have to go and buy and trade. We need windows, we need blinds, we need tables, we need lights, we need all these things. And why should we always be worrying that somebody's going to cheat us and sell us inferior lights or charge us too much for the lights that we finally get? It's all, all a problem, all, all a deep fundamental human problem. It upsets the 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 relationship, the good relationships we could have with one another. So now I want to go back to 21. And I want to go through this paragraph, and then I will stop and see what you think of this. So, we come finally going down that list. The merchant's function is to provide for it, meaning the nation. And the duty of all these men, Ruskin goes on to say, is on due occasion to die for it. On due occasion, namely the soldier, rather than leave his post in battle. Imagine what we would think of soldiers who ran away. The physician rather than leave his post in play. The pastor rather than teach falsehood. The lawyer rather than to countenance injustice. And the merchant, what is his due occasion of death? And the question for the merchant as for all of us, for truly the man who does not know when to die does not know how to live. So now the next paragraph is one of the best in all of us. Observe. He says, the merchants or fu function or manufacturers, for in the broad sense in which it is here used, the word must be understood to include both, is to provide for the nation. It is no more his function to get profit for himself out of that provision than it is a clergyman's function to get his stipend. This stipend is a due and, and necessary adjunct, but not the object of his life if he be a true clergyman. 
any more than his fee or honorarium is the object of life. For a true physician, pause. So, a clergyman is required to do the things that a clergyman is supposed to do, irrespective of the money. He's due the money. He needs a certain amount of money to live, like any one of the vineyard owners, one of the vineyard workers. He, he deserves that money. But the object of his life is not the money. It's the service of being someone who gives us the things that clergy people give us. Neither is his fee going on, the object of his life to a true merchant. All three, if true men, have a work to be done irrespective of fee, to be done even at any cost, or quite the contrary fee. Think of the vineyard owner again. The pastor's function being to teach, the physicians to heal, and the merchants, as I have said, to provide. That is to say, he, the merchant, has to understand to their very root the qualities of the thing he deals in, whatever he produces, and the means of obtaining it and producing it. And he has to apply all his sagacity and energy to the producing or obtaining of it in perfect state and distributing it at the cheapest possible price where it most is needed. So the job of the man who makes all these sweaters I see around the room, yes, or all these uh, glasses that we see on the table, is to provide you with the very best possible glasses or sweaters or shoes or whatever at the highest possible quality, at the cheapest possible price that he can offer them to you to keep, while he keeps his business alive. That's his job. He, will, he should and will, and that's a perfectly legitimate thing to do, make some kind of profit on the dealing of that. But the first objective is not the money. The first objective is to give you good shoes. The first objective is to give you a good sweater. The first objective is to give you good glasses, good whatever. Then we honor you. And then we come back to you. And then we tell all our friends, go to him. He really gives you good work. Right? That's why I have a mechanic like this. I love him. Mm -hmm. Why do I love him? Because I go to him and he fixes my car and he ch ch charges me a fair price and he never recommends anything that he doesn't need to do. Uh, so I spend only the money that I have to. And I sometimes walk in and I say, Joe, that's his name. I say, Joe, Joe, I, I think this is going on. He said, I'll look at it, Jim. You don't need to do anything for 500 miles. It's okay. I recommend Joe to everybody. Because he didn't try to take advantage of me. It is not a caveat emptor situation with me and Joe. He likes me. I like him. I ask him how his kids are. We have a kind of community thing going on. Mm -hmm. That's what the vineyard owner, that's what the parable is all about. The kingdom of heaven is like that. When you are not cheating one another, when you are helping one another, when you are providing each other the things that you need to live well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a great argument. You see how the affections naturally come into play. Ruskin never argues that the affections are important in themselves, just that they're always there. But what he says is, if you treat people well, you're likely to generate positive affection. If you treat them ill, you're likely to generate negative affection. If you generate positive affection, you get me and Joe. If you do negative affection, you get rage and anger, revenge, and all those other nasty things. So he's trying to get his readers who have all accepted this notion that, that merchants are out to cheat us. He's trying to get them to just say, see that this is a fundamentally wrong assumption. The assumption that somehow we are creatures who have been designed to eat each other alive if we can get away with it is just not what we really are. This is revolutionary stuff. Ruskin was very, and he was, of course, roundly, severely criticized by the merchants of his time for saying this. So in this picture, what do you think about competition? Ah, good question. And what he, well, he has a wonderful passage later on in the, in the, in the four essays where he says, he says, fundamentally, um, cooperation, and I can't remember it all fully now, but cooperation is the fundamental principle in life. Co competition is always destructive, always destructive. Because it doesn't, competition and love, they don't go together. They don't go together. 
Now, you might say, and it would be a good thing to say, um, you might say, well, um, what about whatever your profession is about? Let's say you're a sweater maker. I'm just choosing it because I see sweaters around. Um, well, let's say you're a sweater maker. Uh, are you in competition with the other sweater makers? No, Ruskin would say. Your job as a sweater maker is to make just what we just read, is to make the best possible sweaters. And if your sweaters are better than somebody else's, then, the, then the somebody else has to start making sweaters as good as yours. That's up to them to do that or not. Or if they can't make good sweaters, they go and find some other profession. But you're not really ever trying to put somebody out of business. You're not really trying to harm somebody else. You're doing your own job that you've been asked to do at the highest possible quality that you possibly can. So it's not really competition. It's a, it's a, it's a misnomer. Yeah. In between one making a much better sweater at a lower price, yes. putting all the other sweater makers out of business, yeah. you have a whole bunch of families that are going to go hungry before they can gear up and start making a much better themselves also. A better sweater. Because they're, because they're mediocre sweater makers, will those businesses will fail, is what you're saying. Fail, go back up. That's right. Okay. What do you do about them? Right. Good. So, so Ruskin says that what you would do about them is that you would try then to make sure that there were paths for them to be retrained into different kinds of, in different kinds of occupations. He then would say, a lot of this would have to be at government expense. In other words, you know, you can't let you can't let people just go and starve on the street or something like that. You have to waste. So he has the one argument at the very beginning of this, which I don't have here tonight, where he says that that one of the fundamental obligations of of a um, uh, of a society is to make sure that everybody stays fundamentally healthy. So if people are thrown out of business because of market ch- kinds of change, or no, I shouldn't say market. That's the wrong way to say it. Be, be, because that. Uh, this person makes a good sweater, this person makes a mediocre sweater, then the people who make the mediocre sweater are put out of business. He would say you have to find some way to help them find another way of life. But it is a market. I mean, you're trying to... there, there, it, it is a market, but it's not a competitive market. It's doing the best that you possibly can. And then there's another passage in here that I left out of this first essay, which maybe making me think I should put it back in, um, where, where he says essentially what you're trying to do is just make sure that everybody is able to then go ahead with whatever. If that's not your talent, then you find something else of what your talent could be. But you take care of them, right? There's not this falling by the wayside stuff. Yeah. Shanty towns. Could you give an example of you take care of them, what that would look like? Well, he does have, a, a, in the preface to this last, he has a passage where he talks about training schools. Mm-hmm. And, and the, the idea is to see that if, if, well, I mean, we're going through it now, aren't we? I mean, we're really going through this enormous technological shift mm-hmm. where the services, uh, the kind of technological services are now coming to preeminence and lots of other things are falling by the wayside. I don't know what the numbers were 50 years ago, but I think like less than 2% of the American population are farmers. That means a whole lot of people who are farmers have gone out of business. And you can read stories about this in the newspapers where they they go on the road, they become homeless, they're homeless in L.A. Mm -hmm. Uh, So Ruskin would say you have to gather them up and you have to help them find something else useful to do. Mm -hmm. And and people will say, well, how are we going to pay for it? He said, you're going to pay for it. That's what the vineyard owner did. He made sure that nobody became homeless. Mm-hmm. And you have to say that this is what human beings do for one another. That's partially what the, not partially, largely what the affections are all about. I need you today, and if I, you can't do what I needed today, then it's my obligation. Like Joe, my, my, my mechanic, you know, Joe got into trouble, I'd do what I could to help him. Yeah, to bring him back somehow and give him some support. Yeah. What would Ruskin say today, which wasn't, I think, an issue at this time, of the universal basic income concept? Uh, I mean, the metaphor of the parable is, is essentially the same. Everybody needs what they have to have in order to stay healthy and well for the next day. I mean, there's a whole other passage in, um, there's a whole other thing, in another book that he wrote, he said, you have to educate people, you have to make sure that they um, are clothed, you have to make sure that they are fed. You have to make sure that they're housed. What good are any of these people if they're not closed, fed, or housed? I mean, I, I, I don't know, L.A., 
but I've read stories about LA about this homeless population that I, that I think you're having a great deal of difficulty. Well, what good are any of these? I don't mean as human beings. I mean, but, but what good are these people for any of us? They're not good for themselves. They're a drag on the community. They're sometimes dangerous. They, we sometimes lose them altogether to drugs or insanity or whatever. These are, uh, these are dead losses, says Ruskin. So you find some way to, to figure out how to help these people get back on their feet. I don't know what the specific answers are, but mm -hmm. that's, what, that's the principle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's go to the, I want to go to the last one on the bottom of 22, and then we have one at 25, and then we're sort of done with, this, in a way, done with the first essay. Um, so at the very bottom of page 20, sorry, no, page 9, Paragraph 22, the second part of that paragraph. And because the production or obtaining of any commodity involves necessarily the agency of many lives and hands, the merchant becomes, in the course of his business, the master and governor of large masses of men in a more direct, though less confessed way than a military officer or pastor. So that on him falls, in great part, the responsibility for the kind of life they lead. And it becomes his duty not only to be always considering how to produce what he sells in the purest and cheapest forms, but how to make the various employments involved in the production or transference of it the most beneficial to the men employed. An employer is responsible for the well-being of his or her employees. His job is to make sure that they have their penny a day, that he is out for them. He is all for them. He is not trying to exploit them, to take something away from them. And he has this enormous social responsibility. <laughs> so he doesn't fire them willy-nilly. Mm -hmm. um, Ruskin, because he was uh, essentially of a, uh, an upper-middle-class background, as many people in those days did, had servants. Well, the servants got old or they got sick. Ruskin just paid to keep them on. Till they died, because he thought that that was his, they had served him for so many years, and he thought that was his responsibility to do that, and so he did. So we are responsible for these others. So he puts in this paragraph on purpose because so many businesses see their workers as chattel, see them as you know, like Dickens has this metaphor in in Hard Times of the Hands. Doesn't see them as human beings; sees them as hands, and and so and so he, he wants to tell them, no, you, you, this is this is wrong. You, they're human beings like you, and so you're responsible for them and to make their lives decent. So in the third essay, which we may not get to tonight, but in the third essay, he talks about what is a just payment, mm -hmm. and he says just payment is really quite simple. You have to work it out in any given context, but it's really quite simple. You pay somebody, this is the vineyard owner again, you pay somebody what they must have in order to come to work tomorrow at the same strength that they came to work today. That's what you pay them. Okay. This afternoon, uh, I was talking to an employee who was sick for last week, and I sure uh, to ask for your sick days so you get paid for your sick, uh, sick days and she said uh, I don't have any more sick days and I don't know how I'm going to make it to the end of the month mm -hmm. um, so I didn't say anything mm -hmm. and I texted uh, May right away I tell her look uh, May what should we do and we didn't finish the discussion so I feel like Ruskin is giving me the answer mm -hmm. if I'm not I'm asking you if that's that I should go tomorrow morning and tell her you missed 400 hours mm. and you have little kids. Mm. These are 400 hours mm. that we give you so, mm. so that you can make it to the end of the month. And that's the principle. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the principle. Now, if every worker came to you with that problem, you would soon go under. Yeah. And so what Ruskin would say in that situation, and that, then, then that's when you need a government kind of principle to step in and say, well, we, we can't have Joe and his business go under because he performs an, they perform an important function in the community. So uh, we we're very good at Joe and, and uh, to and May to make these, these contributions, but eventually we have to keep you afloat in a different way. So all of the, what, what's so different about all of this to me is that Ruskin is essentially seeing 
our, our, our lives as, as a communal affair. Not a commune, you know, not like what, what the Israelis did or anything like that. But, but, but as a place where we all say we are responsible for the well-being of the other human beings who are with us. And that's what we are expected to do for each other. Another metaphor that works quite nicely is just think about, under normal circumstances, a family. You are responsible for each other, you know? It's the place where you can always go if you need some help. And, you know, relations are not always easy, but that's where, that's the idea of a family, to help human beings become, get through their lives. Same idea. All of which, last paragraph of this, uh, of this essay, uh, and then we chat a little bit as you wish, all of which he says sounds very strange. The only strangeness in the matter being nevertheless that it should so sound. That's a great line. I love that line. For all of this is true, and not partially or theoretically, but everlastingly and practically. All other doctrines than this respecting matters political or economic being false in premises, absurd in deduction, and impossible in practice, consistently with any progressive state of national life. All the life which we now possess as a nation showing itself in the resolute denial and scorn by a few strong minds and faithful hearts of the economic principles now taught to our multitudes, which principles, so far as accepted, lead straight to national destruction. So what he's, that's just another uh, direct attack at the very end on the political economists of his time. Mm -hmm. He's saying, that, you know, why are we in such desperate straits? Because we're trying to destroy each other. That's what we're trying to do. And so he would not say, he probably would say that this is what, this is what the good Lord wants us to do. But he would also say, but that doesn't matter. This is, you can test this. If you mistreat people, you're likely to be mistreated. If you treat them well, you're likely to be treated well. You can't always predict that because human beings are human beings and some people will say, oh, he treated me well, so I'll exploit him. You know, so that's a possibility, but it's much less likely. Mm -hmm. But you treat them, well, treat them ill and you're going to have a lot of difficulty sleeping at night and getting things done. So the roots of honor are service taking care of each other. And he's just trying to say that this notion that you're out to destroy one another and take advantage of your neighbor and make him as weak as her or her as weak as possible is just lunacy. It's lunacy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's more or less the essential arguments of the first essay. So it's to put the, uh, the person in the center. Yeah, yeah that's right. This is what the economy of communion right. is. Exactly. is to put the, the person in the center and you know for us, you know, having this business, it's it's not easy to take decisions. No, it's sure not, not like you have oh, let's give her like four hundred dollars. Yeah, so yeah. Right. you know it's right. Uh, right. that was my first thing. She yeah, needs yeah. it. She yeah. needs to give it to her. Like, you know, how is she going to put the food on the table? Right. Okay. She's so, but still, it's like, oh, if someone knows, they're going to take advantage of this. You need to think about all Right, you this. have to think about it. Yeah, you have to think about everything, because it's not as yeah. simple. So, Ruskin um, uh, always says in other places, he says that these are not doles, these are not handouts without any, without any expectations. You would expect to be paid back. And you would make it clear that in time I expect that you will be in better position and you will pay me back. Um, and he always said that, that with all these helps that would go out, the fundamental, the fundamental commitment of the rest of the, of the social order was to then request of these people that they work. Uh, there's an organization in New York City that I don't think I mentioned the last time I was here. It's called the Doe Fund. And they essentially take homeless men and some women, but mostly men, from the streets of New York, and they house them and they feed them, and they clothe them in a in a dormitory that that, that they have paid for through their own largesse and their own charities and so on, and then they said, for all of this, you will work, 
and they go out and they get them trained to do various jobs in the community. And if they won't work, and they resolutely won't work, and they can work, then they say at the end, okay, we've done everything we can. That's your choice. But we're not, we didn't, we're not responsible for making you do that. You, go, you have to have a skill. You have to become a socially responsible person. So this organization, the Pell Fund that I just mentioned, is in fundamental disagreement with uh, another organization in New York City, which is called the Coalition for the Homeless. And the Coalition for the Homeless essentially says, we just give them whatever they need. Mm. Russell says, you do give them what they need. But then you give them something that will make them into productive members of society, and that's what the work is for. Mm-hmm. And you said, and when you do that, you begin to build up their self-respect again, mm-hmm. and they do not feel useless, and they do not feel anymore that they want to take advantage of you. They want to go out and feel. So the Doe Fund, I've been to this a couple of times. The Doe Fund has every year a, a graduation ceremony. And they have, DOE. I can explain more about that. But basically what they do is they have a graduation ceremony where the men um, who have been through this training process, it usually takes a couple or three years because a lot of these are very damaged human beings. They come up and they get a degree, so to speak, from the Doe Fund for, and again, and they proudly talk about, they're all dressed well, they try to talk about the work that they do, that they've been doing for such a long time, and that they're reclaimed human beings. It's a lovely organization, a lovely mm-hmm. organization. But the work is the key. Human beings can't feel, no human being feels good being useless. You know, they, they get angry, they get frustrated, so you have to find some way to build that back up in them. And then you get their talent, which you had lost before. Mm-hmm. Right. You get their, their ability to, to work in the culture. You know, it doesn't matter what they do. They might be a clerk in a store. They might who knows what they an apprentice in a mechanic shop. I don't know, but they're doing something. So, do, in the seventies, there would be delegations from all over the world and the U.S. come and visit the California prison. Yeah, because they had the lowest form of repeat offense. Uh huh. Less than thirty percent. Seventy percent will go back and be gatefully employed out of prison because they were trained. Great. Yeah. Russell that, said that's great. That was great. Yeah. And then it changed. Right? And then it changed because why? Uh, uh, they stopped training them in prison, or what? Reagan came along as government, uh, and he didn't want to help them in any way. Didn't want this to give was, them anything. This was a burden on the taxpayer. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. So we. Uh, Contracted out of prison. Most of the prisoners in California are living in Vega, hosted in facilities that are owned by private companies mm. right, that regularly fund the referenda to um, restructure out mm. and things like that. Right? So you can push for doing things for the good. But then you have also forces that are pushing the other way. You know, that's that's true. So where does Ruskin see the legal system that's going to protect and preserve a society like this? Well, he would... In a democracy, you can't win. Well... I mean, Ruskin was never much in favor of democracies. <laughs> he always figured that, that democracies were very slow-moving creatures and didn't always move in the, in the best possible directions. Um, he, would, he would say that you need a social order where the fundamental understandings, the fundamental understanding of, of the people who run the social order are that the president of the United States, let's say, his, and hopefully soon her, responsibility is to take care of all the people of the country. And that's what they have to do, figure out how to do that. And there is no other responsibility. They're not in it for themselves. They're not in it to win the next election. They're in it to take care of the people of the country because that's what they're supposed to do. That's the job. And you, so you need then a government. You need to elect people into government in a democracy who essentially will fundamentally say that they, are, they understand what their job is. It's like the mechanic. He's supposed to fix my car. Well... The president's supposed to make sure that everybody's closed and fed and housed and trained and whatever. Also, by the way, the French expression is laissez faire, laissez passer. Yeah. Let go through. Uh, <laughs> uh, untaxed. 
because at the time, at least in France, I don't know in England, but most of continental Europe, there were taxes between provinces. You're carrying mm -hmm. goods from one city to another, you yeah. have to pay uh, duty taxes yeah. uh, at the border of the city yeah. or yeah. the province. Yeah. And, uh, so that concept of the free market, laissez-faire, passer I don't know who it, who coined it first, uh, uh, whether it's a French economist or... Uh, I don't, I don't know either. It's, uh, well, now with uh, uh, what's going on and uh, taxing, uh, um, taxation of importing things and... Uh, right. It's yeah. 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 stuff, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. I have one more comment about the parable. About the parable. Yeah. Uh, so the parable is a parable. My understanding that I've read with many uh, and character later is what Jesus meant by the penny is the forgiveness. Ah. The Father forgives you the same, not more, whether you were a righteous person or the Worst sin. Actually, I thought that was another parable. No, this is, this is the meaning of this parable as it was interpreted by uh, the early fathers of the church, uh -huh. Greek fathers. I don't know the, my religious history enough about that. No, mm -hmm. there is a sermon by uh, Saint Pope Saint John Chrysostom, uh, was Archbishop of Constantinople in the fifth century of Easter. And in the Orthodox Church now, yes. it's part of the regular liturgy of Easter, mm -hmm. so ne neither priest nor bishop can give his or his sermon at Easter Day. The, it's mandated that he reads that sermon. Mm -hmm. and, finish. and in that sermon, Chrysostom conflates several parables into one. Right? So, the workers of the last hours, and also the banquet, uh, the wedding banquet, you know, went in the street and invited everybody because the people invited them to come. But basically say, whether you came in the first hour or the last hour, you're invited the same. You're all the same. Come in and partake of the feast. And, uh, I understand. I understand the argument. That. That's not Ruskin's interpretation of it, but I understand, mm -hmm. I understand the idea of forgiveness there. But Ruskin would say, I think what he would say to that is interesting. Um, uh, these people who were not hired were not hired through any fault of their own. So no one came Ruskin, to, Ruskin no one came to fire, hire them. Yeah. And so, but so there's nothing to be forgiven for. They were ready to go to work. Ruskin is looking at it as a transaction. Yeah. Right. And yeah. Uh, whereas the interpretation from way back is uh, it's a metaphor. <coughs> yeah. It's a metaphor. Yeah, it's a metaphor. Of the right. Everybody is welcome to the kingdom. Right. 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 Sympathetic to Ruskin, yeah. as you know. Yeah. Said contra to two considerations. The first is uh, from from Peter Morin, co-founder of the Catholic mm -hmm. Worker Movement. Uh, among other things, he said we should move from being a society of go-getters to a society of go-givers. Mm. That's but, a nice but, idea. But when he was asked. Well, what are we ultimately looking for at the secular level? What he would say is a society in which it's easier to be good, oh. not in which it's easy to be good, right. Right. but only in which it's easier to be good. Right. Um, now. Sometimes, I think in some presentations, probably not yours, but sometimes some presentations of Ruskin, 
might lead some errors, not us, some errors to think, oh, if we got this going, it would be easy. Mm-hmm. No, only easier, mm-hmm. not easy. No, not easy. None and of this is easy. A, a second point. Uh, Dr. Johnson is a Samuel Johnson is yes. a great hero of mine, and nobody ever confused him with Mr. Rogers. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, uh, he was often goaded, as as you no doubt know, by by James Boswell, to say something sharp about some contemporary. Yeah. And at one point, um, Boswell said, Dr. Johnson, what do, you, what do you make of Hume's view of, of human nature? Of, what do you make of Hume's uh, ethical anthropology? And Johnson says, probably playing the law, well, tell me about it. And Hume's view really was that uh, the ethical life was based on sympathy mm. for one another. Mm. Mm. You could do a lot worse than that. You could do a lot yeah. worse than that. But, but Johnson didn't say, you could do a lot worse than that. Johnson being Johnson said, why, sir, if this is what he thinks, why, sir, when he leaves the house, let us count the spoons. <laughs> <laughs> and his, his, his point was, <laughs> there is such a thing as human sympathy, and I wish there were a lot more of it. Yeah. Yeah. But all we rely on is human sympathy. Well, among other things, think of all the vocations you listed, the Ruskin lists, and then if things don't go well, they must have uh, uh, acted in such a way to show that they have learned to die. Yeah. yeah. Well, things will always, for some of us, go badly wrong. Sure. And yes, without human sympathy, life would be more solitary, more nasty, more brutish, or more short. But even with human sympathy, um, volcanoes erupt. Even with human sympathy, yeah. And I think it's that point. It's and Hitler's point, come. Yes, it's at that point then that you have Dorothy Day, the other co-founder of the Catholic Worker Movement, saying. Don't forget what Father Zosima says. Uh, love and dreams is this way, that way, the other way. Love and practice is, is brutish. Love and practice is terrible. Love and practice is cleaning up after incontinent relatives. Yeah, that's true. Or at night. Yeah. And that's just the half of it. So I think at this point, it's, it's very understandable and perhaps pedagogically astute to put Ruskin to one side and scripture to another side. But in the end, if you want an anthropology that covers human experience, there has to be the dimension of the cross. And we bowdlerize that uh, to our own peril, because then we get confused with Mr. Rogers, Mm. who was a great guy. But only Mr. Rogers. And everybody in the neighborhood was <laughs> open yes. as a cuddle. But uh, mm-hmm. if you go to if you go to not just Skid Row, but all sorts of places, sixty thousand homeless on average yeah. every day in this country. If you go to sixty thousand people, um, God help you if you're not ready for the cross. Yeah. Yeah. Ruskin, um, at the very end of the essays, the fourth essay, um, he talks about what summarizes this best. And he has a couple of paragraphs on what he calls the law of the house. And, uh, and, and well, it, I mean, you made me think about this. Um, the metaphor is that uh, in a house, in a family, we were talking earlier about a family, um, you know, there's, there's the people in charge. They're called the parents or the adults in the room or whatever. And then there's the kids. And, and, and the idea of a family is a, is essentially to take care of everybody in the family so everybody's well. So the, that is the law of the house 
Ruskin would say. And he'd say, in the end, that's what we're striving to do. Now, to your point in a different way, you know, he says, of course, all the things that you would say. You know, there's all these other things that can go wrong, and it's hard as hell sometimes, and whatever, whatever. But he said, what you can do is what you can do. You're the person who has to make a commitment to doing this. Uh, this is your. These are your principles. If you act by these principles, things are likely to be well, as well as they can be. They won't be perfect. They won't be necessarily horror. You won't necessarily not get cancer or whatever it is. Those things. But 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 at least you won't have added to the problem. At least you refuse to add to the problem. Uh, and I think that's very wise advice. I mean, basically, in the end, he says, even though we need government to intervene in these complex ways sometimes and so on. It really comes down to individuals. All real change comes down to individuals. You have to say, this is how I will live my life, whatever happens, and do the best you can to, to live up to that. And if you pick the, the principles that Ruskin's recommending, if you pick those principles, then you begin to spread some yeah. some goodness in the book. And if you don't, or you react, or you get mad at it, and so on, and take revenge, then you start sowing bad things in the world. Uh, in the end, I think it is individual. So that's the slow change. It's slow change. Ruskin hated Marx. He didn't know much about Marx. Marx didn't know much about him, as far as I know. But he hated the idea that, that by collective edict, you could get human beings to do any all these things. He said, no, you have to get... You, in, you, his project was to reform, R Marx's project was to reform the structure of society. And if you reform the structure, things will be good. That's what he basically said. You introduce communism and then things will work out in the end because the problem is capitalism. Right. Much more to be said about that, uh, but not necessarily now. Uh, and, but Ruskin wanted to reform the human heart. That's what he really wanted to do. He wanted you to see, hear it in yourself. All right, that's right. That's right. And so I'm not going to do any more of this other stuff. Yeah. 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 yeah sure. Two things. I think there, there is an intimation of the cross uh, in Ruskin, paragraph 22, the opening part. For truly the man who does not know when to die knows, does not know how to live. Mm -hmm. So the Ruskin presumes the commitment to yeah, death. Yeah, he does. That's right. You know, is, is part of what it really means to be making the commitment mm -hmm. at all. I mean, you may be, you need, to, you need to embrace the consequences, including the unforeseen uh, consequences of that commitment, and there will be difficulties, and it may, and it, it's, it's as if you say, if, if you're not prepared to give your life for what you're committed to, it won't happen. You know, that, that the cross, in effect, is there uh, throughout it. The other thing which I think, I think is always useful in Ruskin is he, the centrality of vision in Ruskin. The greatest thing a human soul ever does in this world is to see something and to tell what it saw in a plain way. Uh, a thousand could speak for, uh, for one who can think. A thousand can think for one who can see. To see clearly is poetry, prophecy, and religion all in one. What he means is that part of the, the whole process of life is to see, is to open your eyes to reality, to open your eyes to other people, to open your eyes to your own life, to your responsibilities, to open your life to nature, your eyes to nature, to the real world, and to what it's requiring you to do and to be. So I think that that visual sense in Ruskin, that it's, it's a matter of of, of seeing clearly. Mm -hmm. I, I think I told you last time, this is a marvelous mm -hmm. incident when Ruskin is, in order to save a fresco that's about to be demolished by developers, and, you know, in Venice, he's working all day to draw the fresco before they destroy this arcade so that there's some record it's not utterly lost to us. And uh, all day long he's having to fight off the urchins who were at the bottom of his ladder. And Ruskin asks in his hotel that night, what does it mean 
though in effect he sees it, what does it mean that I can see the frescoes and I cannot see the urchins? Mm-hmm. You know, that it's all, you know, this function of seeing what's in front of you and, and coming to the right conclusions about the responsibilities of that, that seeing requires you. But, but, but just building on that last line, I mean, that is, Ruskin, absolutely everything you just said is, is right. I mean, seeing, seeing the way things really are, looking them in the eye and understanding them. But he would say, having done that, there is a right human way to act yeah, here. Right. There is a right human way to act here. It is better to treat people well and take care of them than it is to harm them and beat them up. And, you know, it's, it's, it's just clear if you think about it for any length of time. Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. Sorry. Yeah. I, I've been wondering what is the impact, what was the impact of Ruskin's idea to the, to the, to the society where he was living at the time? What Terrible. Yeah. That's why I just wanted to know. Terrible. Also because the interpretation of political economy yeah. has changed a lot from the time of, uh, of Ruskin yeah. to now because the political calendar is politics is service to the economy yeah. is it now it is vested interest and so on mm-hmm. we we may have, we do agree in a lot of uh, mm-hmm. ideas of uh, Ruskin's it's very basic and human a lot of it's things biblical, yeah. but uh, the impact of which is very important to us the people who live in the people who believe it and 18, 1860 was the time where in America is really from a civil war yeah. at the time, and uh, only the only the east and the central was developed, and the west is being being integrated in this sense. So therefore, capitalism, feudalism, in, in some sort, was really very rampant at the time. Mm-hmm. So I don't uh, know. I know you can give me give me an idea of how how much. Society at the time, or government, if, if there was government at the time, the influence of government on economy was uh, sort of influenced by Ruskin's ideas. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's good. It, it, it's good. I have a number of reactions. Uh, the first one is, is that as Ruskin published these essays, they received enormous. You know, widespread and very, very vigorous condemnation by the intellectuals of his time, but mostly by the, by the business people. They hated him for saying these things because they wanted to believe that if they went out and basically looked out for themselves that they were doing good and not doing terrible things. And so they, there were supposed to be seven essays of Unto This Last. And, uh, the, um, uh, the publisher got so much negative response that he told Ruskin, after the third essay, you can have one more, meaning a fourth, and that's it. But he said, we'll give you, we'll give you one more, a double length, so that you can do it. So, so the reaction against Ruskin, not only on this, but on later books that he wrote, they were vicious. They went after him and tried to destroy him. The basis of the legal contract, the wage, mm. has a, a lesser, Reaction to the deeper ideas of Ruskin mm-hmm. and, and the Catholic Church, but the but the, 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 par- but the parable of the of the, vine- of the vineyard owner is a, a minimum wage. No, it's not. Sure, it is. This is what it's, you need to get through a day. Because for me, the min- the the, vin- uh, the wages is a, is a different level of reference theoretical framework. Mm-hmm. It's not a minimum wage. Mm-hmm. For me, it's more than a minimum wage because it's, it's not. It's a li- a li- okay, so it's yeah, not, living's it's okay. Not, it's not a human. It's a. It's not a human reference. Mm-hmm. A yeah. point of the yeah. framework of the mm-hmm. of the vineyard, yeah. the workers of the vineyard. The yeah. physical framework is up there. It's it's not based on on. Mm-hmm. For me, mm-hmm. as a, a political economist, mm-hmm. it, it's very it's something deeper. It is a, it is godly something in itself. Mm-hmm. That's why. I, I wanted to, though it became a basis of uh, social social order, mm-hmm. political intervention in the economy, because economy is getting haywire. Mm-hmm. So therefore, there there are men in the early times, like Ruskin, 
who would like, who wanted to intervene socially and give uh, equal pay, if you want to say, there's a capitalist way of saying equal pay, minimum wage, health insurance, this came up. Ruskin was among the first to recommend all of those things. Yes, okay. He said uh, he said there should be a minimum wage. He said that there should be national health service. He said that women should be educated as well as men to a, the full extent of it. He he said that there should be old age pensions. Should All of the none should of those things existed when Ruskin child, wrote. Child labor. And he said right exactly. He he said all of those things should. Be. And actually, to our credit, you know, we have to think of the last hundred and fifty years. We yes. we have instituted many of those things. Yeah. But and that those are all humanizing things or helpful, what I would call Ruskin's notion of the law of health. Those are helpful things. But now politics has become at the service of, of the economy rather than... That uh, fundamental assumption hasn't changed. I still think yeah. we're a laissez-faire capitalist society. Mm -hmm. I mean, I still think, I mean, we, we see it all around us all the time. You know, uh, the, the rich get richer. He has a whole passage on that. I mean, the third essay is really about about how you eliminate poverty, um, and, and it's basically pay everybody basically what they need to live. Mm -hmm. You don't you don't try to. I mean, he has a model in there which we, uh, I'll just very briefly outline, where he says that you know somebody comes to you to, to work and you need one person, you need one person, two people, you need one job done and two people want to do it. He says, well, what you can do is you can hire one of them and pay them the, the proper fee for doing the work for you for the day. It's not your responsibility to hire the second person. It's not your responsibility to take care of the first person. We just talked about that in that other context, by the way. Uh, and that's what that's what you're supposed to do. But he said what's likely to happen is that you'll bid them off against one another. And you'll pay them each half of what they need to live. And then they begin to struggle. And then now they begin to fall behind. And he said, there's no justice in this at all. I mean, you're, look, look, one of the things here that's so fundamental is this, um, in the fourth essay, um, he talks about, he talks about what is it that we're really looking for? We're looking for healthy, healthy life together. We're looking for human beings to be healthy together, to take care of each other and do the things that are needed to be done. I need to have a mechanic. I need to have the, you know, all the things that I need. I need that stuff. I really do need that stuff. So uh, how do we get that? And the idea is that we get everybody who is able to, to, whatever talents they had, and everybody, he believed everybody had some talents, is that you develop the talents that they have, then they help you, you help them. That doesn't mean there won't be leaders, and it doesn't mean that, as a couple of you have said, that things won't go wrong sometimes. But basically, that's what you're after. Hungry people don't help anybody. Sick people don't help anybody. Uh, so if you can get away from, if you can minimize that as much as possible, then that's what you ought to do. That's what a good society is really trying to do. Yeah. yeah I have one question for you, I'm going to leave for later the question. But you just said now that Ruskin says, what is it that we want? We want to live a happy, happy life. Right? We want, Together, right? yes. And how will you get at that best? The fundamental question today Facing not only us in the U.S., everywhere in the world. Yeah. Who is we? We is all. He uh, would say we is all. If you take a vote in most countries that I know of today, yeah. the yeah. answer is not we is all. No, of course not. We is us and not them, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So we kick them out and then we will be happy ever after. Yeah. Uh, the question I just there is the the period of Ruskin, how widely read was he outside of uh, England? He was widely read in America. Um, he was translated... Not in Europe. Uh, not, well, among right. the educated Europeans who knew English, he was, he was read by very many. Because that period, Europe was going through yeah. tremendous revolution. Yeah, yes, revolution, of course. Revolution. Yeah, Italy was being... Uh, yeah fought over left and right, and uh, there were lots of uh, social, uh, socio-economic ideas, not only Marx. Yeah. Marx was in, based in London, essentially. No, Marx was, actually came later in the 80s and 90s and so on. Yeah. He wrote earlier, but he wasn't translated into English until the 80s and 90s. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, there was a lot of um, 
intellectual ferment in that domain in continental Europe, in France in particular, I read quite a few of those people yeah. at that time. Just translated. Okay. What's that? Say, no, I'm, I'm saying that it was translated in the early 20th century, until this last into Italian, for example, uh, uh. and also in German and also in in French, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, it circulated. But it, later, not... Later. At, at the time, no, I don't think. Uh, it, w it was known, but there were no, I don't, as yeah. far as I know, there were no Italian translations in the, while he was yeah, alive. Yeah. But, I mean, his, his ideas circulated yeah, in, Italy, yeah. in Italy, certainly. Yeah. Um, yeah, just uh, in France, it was mostly Ruskin's art criticism yeah. that was read. Yeah, yeah. Oh, a lot. Okay. And there, you know, Proust translated Ruskin. Oh, okay. The, the Bible of Amiens was translated by Proust. So there was a lot of, they were kind of French Ruskinians, but they were mainly about aesthetics. Mm -hmm. But there's one wow. translation of Unto This Last that had a very significant effect. Gandhi. Oh, yes, yeah. right, right. Yeah, the most it's, significant translation. Yes, uh, Gandhi read uh, Unto This Last. Oh, God, it would have been in the, probably the 20s. I don't have the date right, but anyway, he was he was living in South Africa, and he was a lawyer in South Africa, yeah. and he was very, very upset about the, um, about the uh, apartheid, essentially, yeah. system of South Africa. And... Um, he uh, read onto this last on a, on a train ride one night between mm -hmm. Durban and, and Johannesburg, and he, he just transformed him. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'm going to make my life in concert with these ideas. Mm -hmm. So he took onto this last, and when he went back to India, he translated it into Gujarati, which was his own language, and, and published it in the... And he used Ruskinian principles his whole life. I mean, if you watch, if you watch Gandhi's life, if you look mm -hmm. at Gandhi's life, mm -hmm. it's clear that he did what we were talking about 10 mm -hmm. or 15 minutes ago. He said, I'm going to live my life this way. This is the right way to live a life. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then he did it. And then all the other stuff happened. Right. People in reaction to them. Same thing with Ruskin. Ruskin said, I'm going to live my life this way. This is the right way to live my life. And then people got very angry with him for having said this, such things and, and so on and so forth. But he's, in the end, he's not responsible for them. He's responsible for him and his own, his own life and what, how he comports himself. And so he, I think he would say to a lot of what, what we've been just talking about, he would say, read this carefully. See what I'm really trying to say. And then tell me that the basic idea here, that human beings are essentially going to be better off if they take care of one another than if they exploit one another, is a better idea than the opposite. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, I think, you know, it's, it's an idea in, in, in what? Among many ideas. <coughs> Read it carefully. And then tell me whether I'm wrong about this. And, and, of course, people did tell him he was wrong about this. He would say they hadn't read it carefully enough. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 Just, uh, this is related to, this is a compli compli complicated topic, so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to mention it. Jim already mentioned the law of health. Um, th this is partly what we're talking about, you know, to this last. This, this notion of an integrated system of dependencies that we have on each other. It's like a law of nature. That this is the real way we're meant to live. This is the way we're built to live. Mm -hmm. um, part of what, of course, is the background to some of this discussion is, is Darwin. And social Darwinism. The strongest of the, 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 the uh, survival of the fittest. Mm -hmm. And so there's a whole thing going on in Europe of, that's part of the justification for laissez-faire capitalism. I would say it's one of the most powerful. One of the most powerful. Legitimation. So, laissez-faire. Ruskin's notion of the law of health is, 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 is directly against this. He's saying, no, 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 no. This isn't the way nature is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It isn't that way. What's interesting, this was several years ago, I was in, uh, uh, Berkeley at the Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology. We were having a conference on the trends in 25 years, in various fields, and experts were coming to tell us what we should be expecting, and then we were having various kinds of discussions about it. 
there was very, uh, I don't remember his name, but there was a guy who Skyped in from France who's an evolutionary biologist, and his whole discussion was, oh, he says, Darwin's absolutely wrong. Mm-hmm. He says, survival of the, of the fittest is not, in fact, the way evolutionary advance works. Mm-hmm. And they needed a whole scientific explanation of how cells gather in groups, they defend the weak, uh, one cell is almost always prepared to sacrifice itself for the good of the cellular group. He went into this whole discussion of how cellular formations, and I and I was and I'm watching this, and I'm thinking, the law of health. I mean, this is. I mean, he's proposing, as Ruskin is trying to propose. No, no, the real way nature works is this. This is what nature is meant to do. The pastor's job is to teach it. The yeah. lawyer's job is to see that justice is yeah. done in it. The soldier's job is to defend it. And the merchant's job is to provide for the nation. That's the law of health. Mm-hmm. I, I hadn't thought about it that, that way. Yeah. Yeah. You just yeah. made, help, me, help me think about it that way. You're welcome. Okay, yes, go, go ahead. <laughs> for the we, you know, like you were talking about the we, and uh, Ruskin is saying we is everyone. Yeah, he would say we is everyone, yeah. And Doesn't um, mean everybody agrees, but he said we is everybody. Everyone, because we shouldn't exclude anyone. And because I was thinking, you know, this lawyer who told me like 15 years ago he's a Christian, and he said, but, you know, to defend, to uh, the, the job of a lawyer is not to look for the truth. I was like, what? Yeah, it's to defend yes. my client. Yeah. Yes. I'm like, really? Yeah, the you best know? defense for the client that yeah. you can muster. Yeah, and I didn't get it, you know, like, yeah. is it right? No, of course it's not. It's not right, but it is, in fact, what the way in which lawyers what work. What some people do, even though they are, think like, they think they're doing the, the right thing. So many, many do the wrong thing, but not knowing that mm. it's wrong. Yeah, that's true. So what that is, is uh, you know, our... What should we do, too? Well, you know, I mean, by how you live. I mean, you know, it's a very common saying that that what teachers teach is how they act, not what they actually teach them. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. They watch what you do. It's, it's like kids watching parents, yeah. you know. They watch, and they see what you're doing, and they see what you really are, what, you, what your real values are. And that teaches them more than almost any rules that you lay down. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, a couple of follow-ups. Hmm. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm Gabe and, and the better evolutionist. Hey. Uh, roughly contemporary with Ruskin would be Piotr Kropotkin, hmm. who wrote a book called Mutual Aid. Mutual Aid, right. And that was his account of what evolution is hmm. in terms hmm. of mutual aid. So there's there's that line of thought yeah. that goes back at least as far as Darwin's later years. Mm. Now on the we, who's the we in connection with this uh, idea of mutual aid? Um, there's a an interesting green shoot at the academic level. Uh, a philosopher named Peter van der Schraff. And it's uh, very recent, very recent, I'm just now starting to get reviews of it, written a book called Strategic Justice. Mm. And it's really written theoretically from a game theory perspective. And a lot of us aren't into game theory, but mm-hmm. games are super big <laughs> theoretically, mm-hmm. and game theory is super big theoretically. And what Van der Schraff wants to do is actually take a, 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 a human insight that ethics rests on sympathy, develop that a bit, and say it's a matter of mutual advantage. So it works through really technical, and some not so technical, game theoretic uh, literature, with the aim of showing that people really will seek mutual aid. Mm. 
versus some people are familiar with this prisoner's dilemma stuff, right? Where you can't help but think it's in your interest to be a, a snitch. <laughs> uh, at any rate, now in the development of a game theoretic account of mutual advantage as the best kind of translatable anthropology of the human person. He addresses, as have other philosophers in this tradition, the vulnerability objection. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of ways you can get into the vulnerability objection, but one way is you look around and this person could help you, not now, but could help you later. So you ought to help this person because this person could help you, not now, but later, um, mutual advantage. But then, when you think about we, there are whole groups of human beings that you know perfectly well are not going to help you now, and they're not going to help you in the future. And sometimes you know they're uh, not going to help you, and they're not going to hurt you either, because you're going to make sure that they're not in the future. Right? And so then, who counts as we? Now, I say all of this, last time I was around, I say all of this because we have to have the dimension of the cause. I say all of this around because if we don't have an eschatological dimension that takes us past the next hundred years or so, mm -hmm. uh, well, if we don't have that dimension, we'll lose sight entirely of the kingdom of God in terms of... of uh, uh, all of those in the body of Christ mm. and all those in the body of Christ are perpetually able to be of advantage to us although not visibly able to be advantage uh, of advantage to us and, and so we have all kinds of in many ways socially benign people who are willing to just you know, draw the line here, because these human beings are not going to be helping us, why they won't even be here. And these human beings, they're not going to be helping us because they're not here. But those of us who are doing quite well and are quite productive, who could give each other the shaft, ought not to, because then we might get shafted, you see. But there are a whole bunch of people that are permanently vulnerable, or we can make them to be permanently vulnerable. But of course, in God's eyes, that's not the case at all. We won't talk about that. Yeah, it's not part of the, the public realm of discourse. I don't know why not, but I think Ruskin would, in reaction to what you're saying, I think Ruskin would, would say, you don't think of it as a game. It's not a game. I don't, I don't help you because sometime later on you might help me or anything like that. I help you because it's the right thing to do. You need to help me. There was a threat. And it, it, something, something will happen right later on. I don't know what the something is that's going to happen later yeah. on. Okay. In the third essay, he talks about justice. He says, you can't know what's going to happen as a result of your acting in this way or that way or the other way. You just think it through carefully yourself and do the best you can mm -hmm. to do act as a just and cat, kind human being. Oh. And then whatever happens, it happens. Yes. Although the inclination, the lead in is, don't you see that this will be a help to you as if you give people a good deal, they'll give you a good deal. Well, I think that he basically believes that will be the case, but he never says, that's why you do the right thing. You do the right thing because you know this is the right thing okay. to do. Okay, then, then, in terms of abstract ethical theory, it's not so much a matter that rests on mutual advantage, but it's more to use a technical term, a kind of a deontological thing. Mm. This is good because it's right, as opposed to not, this is right because it's for the good. Who knows? This is, this is a good thing to do because it's right, tight apart from what we anticipate right. it's going and to be. Whereas in the whole Catholic national law tradition, uh, the good is primary. And because something is seen as developing the good, then it is right. It's not that the right is somehow independent of the good. And very often in public discussions, we weave the two together. Yeah. Sometimes this is right because it brings about the good, and then sometimes 
Um, you can't see how it's going to burn with the good. You say, well, damn, it's right anyway. <laughs> So, Those are two different lines of thought. So the in, one is Kantian, right? in, in the fourth essay, he talks about right. And what he says that is right, what he says is right, is healthy, happy, noble human beings. That's right. Make them strong. Make them wise. Make them able to cope with life. That's right. So he doesn't even want to use the word right as sort of an abstract something. Because we could all say, oh, you're right, you're right. I, I know what's right, you know what's right. He says, no, strong healthy, happy Flourish. human beings. Flourish. That's right. All the time, that's right. Make that happen. Yes. I want to uh, just to try to, to add something. Uh, is that uh, I think that in Ruskin, the Christian dimension is, is implied. I mean, it, it starts from there. So uh, I think that the title it gives to Antibus Last gives the key to the, the right. whole right. book mm -hmm. in the sense that we are talking within a Christian evangelical mm -hmm. dimension. It tries in a way to translate into the language of, of economists, uh, of, of the businessmen he is talking about, is writing for the evangelical message. I think that this is important because it doesn't give just practical mm. indications. There is, uh, uh, I think this is implied and it starts yeah. from there. Yeah. So everything might make sense if you start from there. And also the, the quotations, the very quotations, implied quotations sometimes are, I mean, between the lines okay. of the text uh, from the, the, the gospel, from the the Bible uh, give tend to to give the the okay, the light uh, the, yes. um, which yeah. is there. Mm. It's not just a, a, a lay discourse. Mm. I yeah, think yeah, it's yeah, yeah. deeply yes. really evangelical. Mm. I think. Like gospel, oh, God, you say evangelical. I think you mean gospel. Yes. See, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I know yes. that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's yeah. In Italian, it's evangelical. Yes. Yes. Two hundred and seventy-three. Yes, yeah. yeah. not yeah. evangelical yeah. because yeah. he left. He, yeah. he was born as yeah. evangelical. Yeah. 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 But yeah. the gospels. Yeah. yeah. Sorry yeah. about that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, I, 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 I think that this yeah. is um, crucial. Yeah. yeah. And I think along with that, just a uh, is that. One of the pleasures of reading Ruskin is that he's leaving all these all these little cherry bombs in the text. You know, in other words, if you get the allusion uh, both to the Bible or Milton or whatever it might be, you're seeing this in a big frame. And he wants you to, to get the. Of course, his audience would have, uh, 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 you know, uh, understood many of these allusions. They would have, yeah. And so the text would be multi-dimensional already. Uh, that he he wants you to reflect on the relationship of this principle just to a to an allusion to the uh, to something in the Gospels or those all of the allusions that I've left out <laughs> right. with, all the, with the cherry uh, bombs with the with the idea of some clarity getting some clarity into the argument yeah. that they were data for him. Yeah. In, in the way that now, if you were doing uh, some sort of scientific study, you'd produce all this data in support of it. Yeah. That's what he was using. He was using biblical references and saying, look, this is what you were taught in the Bible. He's using classical mythology. Look, this is what Plato said. All the great thinkers of all human time have always said, just what I'm saying today. And he said, this is not new to me. I don't claim this. It's just that everybody who ever thought about these things deeply did that. But when I have people read that stuff, they don't get it. So that's the problem that I'm trying to sort out. Yes, go ahead. It's very important to distinguish what is a calculated giving. Very important. That is not gospel. Calculated giving, for us, the Holy Communion, gratuitous giving, because we have a third partner which we live in our life, which is part in the providence. It is our experience that the free people give gratuitously because God gave gratuitously. We don't calculate. Mm -hmm. I like to, uh, just a, like, this is very important. Mm -hmm. no, sorry. Just to finish up with the, the concept of the, the theoretical framework of the life framework of the EOC is gratuitous giving of free men who have chosen 
to mm. this kind of life mm. because they believe in a third partner or a second partner which is God and that's very important and that he is our inspiration of the gospel is our inspiration but then we put it into practice without calculation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just without calculating mm -hmm. yeah. that's right no that's right Sure. Yeah, sure. um, an experience on um, an entrepreneur in the economy of communion um, and we were I was doing a workshop in the Bay Area and he spoke and um, we have what's called the business cube the company cube and um, it would be something I, I would really like to see if you think about this company cube but it's it's basically how an economy of communion business um, Lives this style of help, mm -hmm. and uh, one of the, one of the, you roll the cube and you live whatever pops up. There's six, obviously six sides, and one of them is uh, love your competitor. And so he gave some examples of loving your competitor, and he mm -hmm. said, uh, for example, you know, I have to hire someone, so I have several uh, resumes, and you know, I choose one. Mm -hmm. But there were maybe four or five that were really, really good. Mm -hmm. I give them to my competitor. Mm -hmm. And he said um, several different things like that where he loves his competitor. And he said one day uh, he got a call from a very young competitor uh, that he had a very good relationship in his, in his city. He lives in Indianapolis. And he said uh, she called and uh, she just broke down and started crying. And she said, one of my best employees, you know, left. You know, and, he, and she said... Um, I just, I just knew if I called you, you would understand. Mm. And she began to mm. tell him, you know, her pain. Mm. And um, and so he said, you know, there's this relationship. This, it's like this example of law of health, mm -hmm. you know. And that's exactly what mm -hmm. um, these entrepreneurs live when they come to communion. Now. That's good. That's a nice, mm -hmm. nice example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. How are we doing, folks? It's 10 o'clock. <laughs> have we once again done the first essay? <laughs> do you want to go on? Do you want to, well, what, I mean, it's as you choose. Jim, why don't you uh, talk a little bit about maybe 74, 75, 77, the end of... Paragraph 74, 75. Yeah. All right. I, I have a sense that we probably should. And uh, there's another reason why we should stop, because... Some people have to go, and some of us have a symposium or whatever we're calling it. You you want to do the one about capital? No, you want to do. Oh, you want to do page forty-seven? Okay, this is good. This is good to do. Yeah. All right, so we'll do this and then we'll end. Okay, because everybody's tired and some of us have to finish papers. Some of us have to get up at five. Yeah. So, yeah. right. Okay, so this is in the, um, uh, this is in the third essay, I think. Or is it the fourth? It's in the fourth essay. Uh, oh, this is, this is the, almost the very end of the book. And so let's go, page 47, paragraph 77. So this actually goes along with, with some of the things we've been saying um, a few moments ago. Um, it is therefore the manner and issue of consumption which are the real tests of production. Production does not consist in things laboriously made, but in things serviceably communicable. Sorry, consumable. Serviceably com com uh, consumable, meaning you can make use of it to make yourself uh, or to become a stronger person. And the question for the nation is not how much labor it employs, but how much life it produces. For as consumption is the end and aim of production, so life is the end and aim of consumption. I left this question in the reader's mind two months ago when these essays first began publishing, choosing rather that he should work it out for himself than have it sharply stated to him. But now the ground being sufficiently broken, I desire in closing this series to leave this one great fact clearly stated. These are his capitals, by the way. There is no wealth but life. Life including all its powers of love, of joy, and of admiration. That country is the richest, which nourishes the greatest number of noble and happy human beings. That man is richest, who having perfected the functions of his own life to the utmost, 
has also the widest helpful influence, both personal and by means of his possessions, over the lives of others. A strange political economy, the only one nevertheless that ever was or can be. All political economy founded on self-interest being but the fulfillment of that which once brought schism into the policy of angels and ruin into the economy of heaven. Mm, Isn't he great? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, to, to write a sentence like this, but he wrote thousands of sentences like this. Oh, uh, that's what Gabriel meant when he said, it's such a joy to read these pages sometimes. Yeah, it's, it's, just, it's, it's just wonderful. But that is one of the great passages of Ruskin, that right there. I mean, and, and it is the summation of the whole thing. Strong, healthy, happy human beings. Mm-hmm. That's we, and that's what we should all be yeah. trying to figure it out, how to get there for ourselves and those who, yeah. whose lives we touch. Mm-hmm. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. What's that? We're going to Huntington. <laughs> ah, good. Good. The more, the better. We're delighted you're coming to Huntington. That's great. Thank you. I think we'll stop, eh? Because we're tired. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, at least I know one of us is tired. <laughs> You can read this slowly and be in touch with me about any of it. Okay. Yeah, and maybe if I come back again, we'll do the later chapters. Yeah, you have your email. Yeah, you have your email. Yeah, yeah, maybe. I'll send you the podcast. Oh, please do. Yeah. Please, thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you. It's great to see everybody. Thank, Thank you for your patience and your time. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.